thanks everyone uh, for joining. I know it's an unusual uh, date and uh, though one nice thing about it, I guess, is that it did give us some time to recover from the power outages. I, my power was out for about 17 hours. I, uh, I'm sure a lot of people talk about the, the varying times that their, their power was out. It was difficult being away from the internet for so long. Um, luckily, we're back, uh, and part of part of the uh, joys of the internet is we get to do this uh, Zoom workshop uh, with our colleague Paul Cassell. Paul needs no lengthy introduction. Uh, you know, the, uh, he is presenting about uh, de-policing in the context uh, of the George Floyd protests. Um, he, it's, this, it's another sort of important paper uh, in this line. I'm looking forward to hearing his presentation. Without further ado, Paul Cassell. Thanks, Matt, and uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, uh, today, I'm going to be talking about the recent homicide spikes in U.S. cities, trying to explain what's happening. And I'm going to be suggesting that there is a Minneapolis effect, a, a decline in proactive policing that's uh, the cause. So uh, let's dive right in. Um, my paper, uh, which will be appearing in the Federal Sentencing Reporter, will be joined with another paper, which was sort of the springboard for all of this. Uh, Professor Richard Rosenfeld and a colleague released a report in uh, ju late July of this year, uh, and they concluded that homicides and aggravated assaults, uh, uh, perhaps shootings, rose significantly in late May, June of 2020. Uh, their date ends at the end of June 2020. And here is the key slide in their report, uh, which shows that homicides have spiked in America since late May of this year, just a couple of months ago. If you look at the figure one in their report, what you're looking at there is weekly data starting uh, at the beginning of 2017. They average about 20 or so cities for each week. You can see a little bit of seasonality to the homicide uh, uh, numbers in this country, uh, up somewhat in the summer and down somewhat in the winter. Just a slightly increasing trend uh, over time. And then all of a sudden, uh, things really abruptly change. Uh, what econometricians call a structural shift occurs uh, beginning right at the last week in May of 2020. Uh, there are five data points and you can see them uh, all here in the upper right hand corner, uh, the last week in May and the, and the four weeks of June, all which are above average. This is what uh, is called a structural break. And so something has changed. There's been a spike in homicides uh, since late May. Uh, if you look at uh, other reports, you can also see that homicide spikes are widespread around the country. Here's something that the Wall Street Journal uh, put together. This is based on the largest uh, 15 cities in the United States. You'll see homicides are up pretty much consistently all across the country, Austin, Chicago, other cities. Uh, uh, Dallas is here. Uh, uh, it has since uh, moved over into uh, positive territory uh, or, or increased territory, I guess I should say. It's got a homicide spike for this year. Uh, so we're seeing widespread homicide spikes across the country. If we drill in to see what those homicide spikes look like in particular cities, uh, here's Minneapolis, where homicides are up about 95% year over year, about uh, 20 uh, last year uh, through this time, through uh, about uh, up to about 40 this time. And the data is a little bit chunky because fortunately in Minneapolis, there aren't a lot of homicides each week, but you can see here on the, the red line, the number of homicides that are occurring in 2020. Uh, the gray line in the background is uh, the average for the last five years and uh, sort of a gray band of, of the highest and lowest over the last five years. You can uh, get a little bit clearer uh, uh, understanding of when these homicide spikes and shooting spikes are occurring by looking at this slide. Uh, this is interesting data. This is uh, shooting data from the city of Minneapolis. Again, weekly data uh, over the course of the first uh, seven or eight months. And you can see shootings are bouncing around uh, at uh, so maybe uh, uh, 20 or so. Uh, uh, and then we have uh, George Floyd's death on May 25th. About two to three days later is when uh, there's a significant uh, uh, protest that turns violent in Minneapolis. And then uh, after that uh, violence dissipates, we see that shootings are about twice as high uh, for June and July as they were uh, previously. One of the things that's interesting about this data set is it is uh, acoustic uh, shot spot data uh, from the shot spotter system that uh, the Minneapolis Police Department to maintain. So this does not depend on victim reports or citizen cooperation. This is simply the number of, of shots detected. And you see a very clear spike and then uh, a sustained increase following uh, George Floyd's death. Um, 
Another point to be um, made about the homicide and shooting spikes is that they are confined to essentially those crime categories, perhaps aggravated assault, which overlaps a bit with shootings. Uh, you don't see it in the property crime uh, uh, trends. And so here is uh, the total of all property crimes in Minneapolis. You can see uh, roughly within historical averages going through uh, about the uh, end of May. And then there's just a dramatic spike in burglaries, uh, particularly if you drill into the data, commercial burglaries uh, in Minneapolis when the looting occurred, and then things returned to, to roughly historical averages after that. Uh, so we see a, a unique shooting and homicide uh, uh, spike. Here's, uh, if we drill into the Chicago data, you can see, again, the red line is uh, what's happening this year in Chicago, juxtaposed uh, against the background of historical averages, a little bit of an increase in April. But the big spike in Chicago is uh, right after uh, uh, May 27th, uh, continuing in through July uh, and August. Uh, as of August 1st, 2020, homicides are up 50% uh, year over year, up 139% uh, uh, year over year in the month of July. Uh, July was uh, one of the most violent months in recent decades in Chicago. Uh, Chicago shootings, again, you can get a little bit of a smoother data set uh, with a larger number of data points. Here are the shootings within historical averages in Chicago. Uh, suddenly a tremendous increase uh, right after uh, about May 27th, uh, which you see depicted on this red line here, well above seasonal averages, well above historical averages. Uh, homicides in Philadelphia, up 32%, uh, that's a year over year increase. They had a little bit of an increase, uh, well actually a, a significant increase in, in early J January, but the big increases uh, above average are, are occurring here right after uh, the protests, 30% year over year increase. Milwaukee homicides are up 100% uh, uh, increase as of July 1st. As of September 4th, year over year increase is 82%. Uh, and you see that uh, reflected on the red line here. Um, New York homicides uh, within historical averages, there is a spike in April and then the big spike uh, begins in June. Uh, I don't have July data. New York releases its data on a quarterly basis, but uh, I have been able to learn that uh, if we had July data, there would be a 50% year over year increase uh, in July. So very significant increase uh, uh, occurring in June and July in New York. So if we're trying to figure out what is the uh, causal factor for all this, uh, the causal factor should be able to explain a, um, let's see, uh, an abrupt uh, increase in homicides and shootings uh, beginning in the last week of May 2020. It should have remained in place throughout June and July of this year. Uh, it should have caused an increase in homicides and shootings uniquely, uh, leaving other crime categories uh, largely unaffected. Uh, it should have occurred in U.S. cities but not rural, uh, rural areas. This is a tentative conclusion. I've been trying to find crime data on homicides in rural areas. I haven't found any mention of homicide spikes leading me to conclude tentatively that we're looking at a city phenomenon. Uh, and then uh, if you look at some of the city data, Chicago, for example, you find that the spikes are occurring, uh, for example, on the south and west sides of Chicago, uh, disadvantaged neighborhoods, uh, 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 particularly minority neighborhoods. Uh, and so what could explain uh, these, uh, these facts? Well, let's try to go through a process of elimination and see if we can eliminate some possibilities because that will maybe uh, produce uh, in starker relief what the causal factor is. One thing you might wonder about is, okay, well, the, the timing does seem to follow immediately after the George Floyd protests. Uh, what about during those protests? But that really doesn't seem to fit. It's the most protests were not violent and, and even the protests that turned violent really didn't have a significant number of homicides, certainly not a significant number uh, that could explain the spikes. How about seasonal impacts? We know that homicides increase over the summer in general particularly in cities like Chicago. Uh, but as you could see on the charts we were looking at earlier, uh, these increases are well above seasonal average. They're also uh, spread across the nation from cities like Chicago that do have significant seasonality to cities like uh, Austin and, and some warm weather uh, cities that don't have the same kind of seasonal effects. Uh, so seasonal impacts don't seem to be the cause. What about increase in firearms purchases? I think many of you may have seen news reports that uh, there were uh, significant increases in firearms during the uh, pandemic. Um, here you see, I guess on March 13th, uh, the start of the pandemic, President Trump declares a national emergency. 
huge increase in firearms purchases, another increase in April, continuing increase in June. The point of this slide is that we don't see anything that uh, is uniquely confined uh, to uh, late May and, and June and July that would explain the spike. And it also uh, needs to be mentioned that uh, America has approximately 400 million firearms in private hands right now. What we're looking at here on this slide from the Brookings Institute is, uh, is, is about an additional 2 million uh, uh, firearm sales, not enough to really explain something uniquely occurring in uh, late May and June and July. Uh, what about rising unemployment? We know that there have been increases in unemployment. Here's uh, Department of Labor data, uh, weekly data, I believe, starting uh, in about uh, mid-March. Uh, we see the uh, pandemic and the shutdowns causing an increase in, in unemployment, both uh, seasonally and, and not seasonally adjusted. Uh, but then it, uh, its uh, uh, high point is uh, right around, I think, late April. As you go through May, you see things begin to decline. Uh, none of that coincides particularly with the start of the protest. So rising unemployment really doesn't seem to be uh, the explanatory factor here. And we should also, re -mention, uh, also mention that uh, we did have uh, relief efforts such as the CARES Act, which uh, carried on through uh, uh, May and June and July to provide some kind of relief. So it doesn't seem like unemployment would be the explanatory factor particularly since rising unemployment is typically linked with property crimes, not with uh, homicides and shooting crimes. Um, finally, what about, I guess, the elephant in the room? What about the COVID-19 pandemic? Could that have caused uh, these shooting spikes? Uh, I guess there might be a theory that maybe people were cooped up in the, the shut at home uh, uh, when the shut at home orders came along and then they got back out and pent up violence exploded, something along those lines. Here is data on social mobility, cell phone data from the well-regarded University of Washington website. Uh, we see the start of the pandemic uh, around uh, March 10th or something. Social mobility in this country reaches its low point around April 8th. And then there is a uh, <clears throat> steady march upward through April, May, continuing in June and remains stable through July. The point to be made here is we don't see any sudden increase uh, right around the end of May that would trigger a homicide spike, uh, at least based on social distancing data. Since that seems to be the uh, causal mechanism for the theory that maybe the pandemic had something to do with homicide spikes, uh, that doesn't really seem to fit either. And so what is the cause? Uh, the thesis of my paper is that a Minneapolis effect is the cause of homicide spikes. Uh, I could explain why we see suddenly uh, in the wake of anti-police protests surrounding George Floyd's death, uh, less policing and particularly uh, less proactive policing has occurred. Uh, for example, for at least a couple of weeks, uh, police officers were redeployed to respond to protests. They were on the uh, uh, demonstration lines. Uh, as protests uh, abated, uh, police officers pulled back from proactive policing, such as stop and frisk and those sorts of things. Also, law enforcement capabilities have diminished uh, as a result of reduced funding and other setbacks, increased retirements due to demoralization. And the consequence of all this has been a reduction in gun act, I'm sorry, law enforcement activity directed at gun violence. And the result has been uh, perhaps unsurprisingly an increase in gun violence. Let's drill into a particular, the, the five cities that uh, the paper tries to explore and, and see what we can see in those cities. So here's data on Minneapolis. Um, and you'll notice that the number of street stops uh, which might be uh, uniquely uh, targeted at firearms violence uh, since street stops are oftentimes designed to, to take guns out of, out of the hands of criminals. But we see pretty much historical averages starts to drop during the pandemic, goes back, you know, roughly within historical averages. And then right uh, at the start of the protests in Minneapolis, uh, there are some street stops probably associated with the, uh, with the protest, uh, but then things fall and you can see here uh, uh, quite a bit below uh, historical averages in Minneapolis. Uh, Chicago, uh, uh, another way to try to get a measure uh, on proactive policing, it's hard because there isn't a single statistic that captures that, but maybe arrest data would capture that. Here's arrest data in Chicago, the red line juxtaposed against historical averages. Start of the pandemic, arrests go way down, probably because of declines in social mobility. Social mobility begins to increase in Chicago as the shutdown orders are relaxed things begin to, to start to return towards normal. And then you have the start of the protest, significant uh, uh, violence, uh, perhaps reducing arrests here in Chicago, and then a significant decline in arrests. Arrests uh, 
well below historical averages uh, in, in Chicago uh, for uh, June and July. Um, Philadelphia, been able to find some pedestrian, I'm sorry, vehicle stock data, declines during the pandemic, returns to around normal levels, then the protests hit, see a dramatic decrease in uh, vehicle stops. Um, Milwaukee police haven't been able to get data, but qualitative information has its role to play in, in uh, analyzing these kinds of events. Here's two quotes from uh, two leaders in the Milwaukee Police Department. Uh, they both uh, are uh, aware, obviously, of the homicide spikes in, uh, in Milwaukee, and they uh, point to uh, the depolicing kind of phenomenon, particularly that there is minimal uh, proactive policing right now, says Milwaukee Police Inspector uh, Leslie Thiel. Uh, uh, the other inspector, Terrence Gordon, reports that they were on the demonstration lines and then it was hard to get back to normal. Um, and uh, that's uh, what they attribute the homicide spike in Milwaukee to. What about New York? Uh, New York, our nation's largest city, has lots of crime data available. Here is total arrests in New York below average uh, through uh, um, about middle of March, although close to historical averages. Then a big decline as the pandemic strikes New York. Uh, social mobility begins to increase. Arrests again begin to approach normal levels. And then uh, I think the line here goes in at uh, May 27th. Uh, looting in New York occurs on June 1st and June 2nd right there, probably producing a spike in arrest. And then you see this decline, June 8th, et cetera. Uh, and uh, through the rest of June, arrests are well below average. Uh, I don't depict on this chart, but I have data from NYPD going through July. Would look something like this, uh, would remain uh, uh, below the 300 level uh, all the way through July. Uh, and this, uh, if you juxtapose that information with this information, you can see the potential for a cause and effect argument. This is shooting, so we have uh, you know a larger data set than just uh, just homicides, for example. You can see uh, shootings are within historical averages in New York. Here's the start of the protest, and they go through. I, I know the, the phrase is overused. You know they skyrocket, but this uh, you know this is a chart. I think it's fair to sh say showing uh, skyrocketing uh, shootings in New York City, uh, tremendously above historical averages. Uh, and coinciding with the, the decline in arrest that we were looking at uh, uh, a moment ago. Uh, so I think uh, it's fair to say that some kind of change in law enforcement is the most likely cause of these changes in homicides and shootings. There are two different versions of the theory, though. Uh, Professor Rosenfeld, in the article I was mentioning at the start of, of my presentation, has tied uh, uh, deep policing uh, and delegitimization as uh, potential explanatory factors for uh, changes in law enforcement. Uh, and this ties back to the so-called Ferguson effect, increases in homicides that were noticed in this country in the wake of uh, the death of Michael Brown uh, in the summer of 2014. Um, you can say it's uh, depolicing, and, and I've tried to make that argument with some of the data you've seen here, but there's a second version of the argument, which is to turn the depolicing argument on its head and say, look, uh, what's going on is not uh, cops pulling back, but the citizenry pulling back. Uh, communities, particularly disadvantaged communities of color, are drawing further away from police due to breached trust and lost confidence. And as a result of diminished uh, police legitimacy, fewer people report crimes, they don't cooperate uh, with law enforcement, and they engage in street justice to settle disputes. So that is a different hypothesis, certainly worth uh, exploring. The way that that hypothesis has traditionally been explored is to collect 911 data to see if calls for police service uh, decline uh, in the wake of, for example, a publicized incident of, of police abuse. So I've gone uh, to Minneapolis to get 911 call data. And here in red again, you see the data. I think this is on a weekly basis through uh, about, uh, I think, uh, mid-August here in, in Minneapolis, give or take. Um, and juxtaposed in the background is, is call data uh, from uh, the last three years. We see a bit of a spike uh, going on uh, during the looting that occurred uh, around May 29th in, in Minneapolis, but then things uh, return a little bit below average, but essentially around average uh, uh, over the next uh, uh, two months or so. Obviously, we'd like to have more granular data than 911 call data for all of Minneapolis. Um, I've been able to get uh, data broken out by the five different precincts in Minneapolis, and looked in particular at the uh, looked at the third uh, 
precinct uh, where George Floyd died in particular don't see any unique and sustained decline in 911 calls that would seem to explain the homicide spike. Um, here's just, uh, I've gotten some data from Cook County, but let's jump into the New York City data. Uh, again, uh, juxtaposed against uh, 2019 data for some historical uh, averages. You see the spike occurring right when uh, uh, the looting occurs on June 1st and 2nd in New York, then things return to, to roughly historical average. Again, we would like more granularity in the data here, but nothing is jumping out immediately to suggest the decline in 911 calls or delegitimization that might explain the spike. One other way of perhaps exploring the issue is by looking at uh, public opinion data. Uh, there is a long-term downward decline in trust uh, of American law enforcement, uh, but a very recent poll from, uh, I believe, Gallup uh, shows that uh, as of, I think, uh, late June, early July, 86% of U.S. adults wanted the same or more police presence where they live, uh, slightly lower but not dramatically lower uh, numbers for Black Americans and Hispanic Americans. So I don't think that some sudden change in police legitimacy can explain uh, what went on. I think we're uh, looking at a depolicing theory as being the more uh, uh, cogent uh, and more supported by the data. Uh, and one last reason for reaching that conclusion is uh, by looking at parallels to the 2016 Chicago homicide spike. As I mentioned, a, a Ferguson effect was proposed uh, back around that time. Uh, and I think it's fair to say I'm probably biased on this, but the most detailed paper to explore a particular city and try to explain a homicide spike in the time is uh, a paper that Professor uh, Fowles here at the University of Utah and I uh, did together. Uh, what we were able to, to look at uh, was a decline in stop and frisk. The blue line on the chart here is the number of stop and frisks that uh, go on uh, over a couple of years in Chicago, about 50,000 a year. You see the seasonality that we've talked about, slightly more stop and frisk in the summer. And then right around uh, December of 2015, stop and frisk go from about 50,000 a month to 10,000 a month. That's an 80% decline, just a massive decline. Uh, and what is the result? The orange line here is homicides in Chicago. You can see the seasonality in the four previous years. And then in 2016, homicides increased 50% uh, uh, year over year. Uh, and Professor Fowles and I with multiple regression equations and others uh, believe that uh, we have strong uh, evidence that the cause of the spike was the decline in stop and frisk. The point that I want to pull out of the Chicago data and the Chicago experience in 2016 is that what increased in Chicago was shootings and homicides, but not other crimes. And that was a strange pattern that people had difficulty explaining at the time. And I think what's going on in America in the summer of 2020 is sadly what uh, took place on the streets of Chicago in 2016. We're seeing a significant reduction in law enforcement activity directed against gun violence. And the result is an increase in homicide and shooting crimes that are particularly responsive to law enforcement efforts. Um, and that uh, is the explanation. The causal inference, of course, is always a complicated one to reach in social science uh, research. However, I think here we have uh, multiple interlocking arguments that support my conclusion. I've tried to present some quantitative data showing declining levels of policing in cities the, that I investigated. There's also an underlying empirical support for linking policing and gun crimes. Uh, for example, the National Academy of Sciences released a report on proactive policing a couple of years ago, indicating that proactive policing can produce declines in uh, homicides and shootings and suggesting at least in a few of the studies that maybe those uh, declines would be confined to those crime categories. Uh, there's also a qualitative suggestion, for example, in Minneapolis and in the paper I have collect information from uh, all the other cities as well, that declining policing is occurring in the wake of the George Floyd uh, protest. And so we have mutually reinforcing arguments producing the uh, conclusion that deep policing is the cause of the nation's homicide spikes. We're able to uh, estimate uh, the size of the homicide spike. Uh, the way I did that was to take the 37% increase in homicides that Rosenfeld and Lopez uh, identified the structural break. Uh, let me uh, assume that 80% of the spike is due to this deep policing effect. Obviously, there are a lot of things happening in America. Uh, I'll just uh, set aside a 20% uh, unexplained factor. Uh, but if we assume 80% is attributable to this deep policing, then we come up with an estimate of about 710 additional homicides that occurred in June and July of this, uh, uh, this year and about 2,800 additional uh, shootings. Um, and 
Let's see. Uh, of course, uh, whenever we have econometric uh, numbers, it's always important to remember that behind those numbers uh, lie uh, real victims. Uh, for example, here's a headline uh, from the Chicago Tribune about uh, what happened and it's uh, on May 31st of this year. There were 18 murders in 24 hours. It was the most violent day in 60 years in Chicago. Uh, if you look at the, the cities that I've explored and uh, try to reach uh, reasonable conclusions about uh, the distribution of victims of the homicide spike, uh, very conservatively, about 80% of the victims killed due to the Minneapolis effect are black or brown, most of them residing in disadvantaged communities. You can see, for example, uh, that the uh, map here shows the south and west sides of Chicago is where the homicides uh, that have occurred in 2020 have been disproportionately concentrated. And so what are the policy implications of all this? Uh, the paper argues that uh, criminal justice researchers should immediately begin further investigation of the homicide spikes and their causes. It's hard to imagine a single issue in criminal justice right now that's more urgent than this. Uh, whether you accept my theory or not, it's clear that uh, hundreds of additional people have died in the last several months and thousands of additional people have been shot and we need to figure out why. Uh, researchers should uh, focus particularly on the possibility of declines in proactive policing. It's difficult to get a handle on proactive policing because of the difficulty of obtaining uh, data about how police departments uh, deploy their forces, but that should be uh, a focus of great interest. Uh, researchers should also take advantage of the real-time data that's emerging. Uh, this paper could not have been written several years ago because it takes usually a year or so for police data to be available, but now data is becoming uh, much more quickly available and, and researchers should take advantage of that. Policymakers should also acknowledge homicide spikes and begin discussion of possible responses. Obviously, there's a huge and urgent conversation going on in this country about police misconduct and how to deal with police violence. Uh, and I don't mean to take away from that conversation, but it's an important conversation to have as well about why are hundreds of additional uh, homicides occurring around the country today. Uh, and based on the evidence collected here, it's my prediction that the ultimate policy recommendation will be that legislators should proceed with caution before defunding the police in ways that reduce proactive policing. I'm aware that the term uh, defunding the police is, is an umbrella term and it includes a variety of things. I certainly don't mean to suggest that some of those ideas are, are bad ideas, uh, but I do mean to suggest caution when defunding includes reducing proactive policing. For example, around July 1st, the NYPD, the New York City Police Department, saw a $1 billion cut in its budget. Some of that uh, may or may not have been a, a real cut uh, but it is clear they suffered a loss in overtime pay, which meant that some of their most experienced officers were pulled back from surge policing or anti-gun policing. And uh, I think sadly, we've seen the results on the city uh, streets of New York. So in conclusion, I think we need to consider all possible responses, including uh, proactive uh, police responses to combat this surge in gun violence, uh, which is plaguing America today. And you can read uh, a full copy of the paper either on SSRN where it was uh, posted this morning or uh, be forthcoming in the Federal Sentencing Reporter. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, um, would you like me to keep the queue or would you prefer to keep the queue? You know, if you wouldn't mind doing it, that, that way I can focus on uh, responding to questions and you can focus on some of the logistics. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, all right, so I have, uh, let's start with uh, Dean Warner and then I have a remote question from Cliff who's connected via phone that I can read out. Uh, so, uh, Dean Warner. All right, great. Thank you, Paul, so much. I really enjoyed that presentation, and it's um, definitely provocative and timely and, and uh, thought-provoking. Um, I had a, a couple of questions. So, my first question is, uh, you went through and you talked individually about how um, you know things like the heat and the pandemic and job loss and the race riots um, and protests when individually impacted, but you didn't talk about the aggregate. And I'm wondering if in the aggregate, all of those things um, could be leading to this because from my own personal experience as being a domestic violence advocate, I know that we would see spikes in domestic violence around times of stress and crisis. So after the holidays, for example, we would see spikes in domestic violence. And so I'm wondering if all of these things coming together right now in this historic time uh, could possibly be causing it in the aggregate. And then secondly, the other thing that I was wondering if you had considered is there's been a lot of research to suggest that um, 
it's a lack of services that oftentimes lead to violence, that the police are only called in when the services have failed. And so I'm wondering if another possible reason to explain the, the spike that we're seeing or the increase that we're seeing this summer is because there's been a reduction in services, both because budgets have been cut and because in-person services are not possible um, in the current pandemic environment. And so that was another issue I was wondering if you had considered. Wow, lots of things there, lots of good uh, things to think about. Uh, domestic violence uh, is something obviously uh, as someone who tries to keep uh, a thumb on the pulse of uh, crime victims issues in the country, I've, I'm aware of. Uh, there has been a spike in domestic violence, including domestic violence homicides. Uh, a couple of uh, colleagues of ours down at BYU have actually published a, a very thoughtful paper on this documenting that. Uh, the spike, however, in domestic violence occurs in April, begins in April, uh, which makes sense. That's when folks were locked up uh, with the shutdown orders around the country and, and you know, victims and perpetrators are in close proximity uh, and there are natural stresses associated with being locked up. So the timing of domestic violence in particular doesn't, uh, doesn't work. Um, but you, you, know, you have an interesting theory, an aggregate increase theory. One of the, the problems with responding to a theory like that is, is how is it testable? Um, you know, it, it's sort of a, a non-quantitative, once we hit a certain threshold, there's then a, a jump uh, in an aggression or, or violence because of all these things coming together. None of the things that I looked at you know, uniquely started to accelerate around late May. Uh, you know, social mobility, all those other things are, are moving in longer term trajectories. So I don't think it could be an aggregate of all this, although, you know, a lot of weird things are happening in America right now. So I wouldn't, would be naive for me to say that some of these other things couldn't be involved. Budget cuts, budget cuts, I think are gonna play a huge role in explaining uh, what's going on in American policing going on in American social services, going on in American education in the future. But the budget cuts haven't hit yet. The only budget cut that's hit a police department that I've been able to tell is NYPD on July 1st, uh, which compounded the problems they were having there. Minneapolis famously has been talking about defunding the police, but the, uh, the vote on that has been postponed and, and Chicago and other cities have not yet uh, cut, uh, cut their funding yet. So I think that's certainly something to, to pay attention to, but cannot explain what began happening in America the last uh, last week in May. <clears throat> All right, uh, next we have a question from Tennille Brown. Tennille? Hey, so um, thanks for your talk. And I guess um, I would just question why you need to advance such a strong argument that, that the Minneapolis effect is the cause. Uh, I think I'm sold that it's probably a cause, uh, but I'm not convinced at all that unemployment, poverty, the aggregate effects uh, or the isolated effects. I wasn't even convinced on the slide of unemployment that unemployment alone couldn't be an effect right. because some causes are latent and you don't lose your job and then immediately shoot people because the stress takes time to build. Uh, the fear and the, um, the de depression, anxiety sometimes takes some time to develop. So the time sequence, I guess I would challenge is just because you're not seeing a spike immediately after the spike in unemployment that doesn't suggest that unemployment is not also a cause. Uh, and the same I would say for gun sales. I, I'm not sure that the time cause and effect needs to be immediately proceeding in order to be an effect. Uh, and I also question um, how this then could explain spikes in crime in Hubei province in China or in Brazil or in Greece, where there have also been spikes both in domestic violence and in other forms of crime. And so I would just say your argument is really strong if you're more modest about it being a cause as opposed to the cause. Because as soon as you present it as the cause, I immediately get a defensive reaction of saying, you haven't convinced me that any of these other things aren't also causes and you don't need them to be the cause. It's, it's a very powerful argument to just say it's a cause. So I guess I'm questioning what the value is in taking such a strong stance on causality when I don't think you can defend that. And I, respectfully don't think right. you defended it here. Right. Yeah, so um, the reason, the, the, the problem that I guess I'm worried about with saying it's a cause is it then descends into meaninglessness because people will say, well, if it's a cause, let's go deal with the other nine things and then Professor Cassell three years from now, we'll get back to your cause. Um, it's a cause, but it's not a big deal cause or you can't tell me it's a big deal cause, so who cares? 
so that's I think the the policy reason or or you know why why I is I want to say to policymakers I think it's the cause and I think your point um, a couple of thoughts on your point first uh, I'm only trying to explain the delta the change in homicide so there is you know a lot of there were a lot of other things going on domestic violence gang violence things like that they're out there but it, I I think it's important to remember I don't purport to explain violence in America, I purport to explain a 37% increase in underlying homicide. So maybe my argument can be a bit more convincing if, if the, the, the claim is not, you know, trying to get my, my image there. It's not trying to explain all of this. I'm trying to explain, you know, this, what, you know, the, the, the piece of it that's the increase. The other I don't think you can do that because you can't get unemployment, poverty, those. I get the policy reason to want to say it's the cause, but I don't think based on the numbers, there's a lot of noise uh, in what's happened and what's happening internationally. There have been no George Floyd protests in China, as far as I know, but they've seen a spike in crime. So how do you explain that? I think I, I would just recommend being a bit more modest because I think there'll be more policy chaos because people won't dismiss your argument. Yeah, you know, you're right. You're not the first one to suggest I would, my arguments would benefit from being a bit more modest so uh they're more uh, credible then they're more credible yes and that's obviously you know quite important so um um and then matt uh also thoughtfully commented on my paper and, and i think made a very similar similar point you know there's always there's what is it first draft syndrome i've solved the world's problems let me put it out and maybe the the second draft um nuances need to be a, a, a bit uh a bit stronger. I, I have to confess, I'm not aware of the international data. I'm, um, you know, I'm an American criminal justice researcher, which is maybe a flaw uh, that you're you're nicely pointing out. Um, not a flaw, not a flaw. Just maybe there are explanations there, and maybe they're different. Maybe they could be distinguished in some way. Do you but, do you have access to those links that you could just forward along to me? Because I haven't. I've been paying, you know, diligent attention to every city in the country, from Austin to Albuquerque to wherever. Sure. Think of sure, I'd be happy to send. I know that Hubei province specifically and um, organized crime and violence associated with organized crime in Italy spiked. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, yeah, I don't know how robust the data are, but I can definitely, I can definitely share what I've read about the spikes in crime. That, that would be great. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, next, we have a question from Robin Craig. All right. Uh, Paul, just kind of uh, going to this multiple things going on, um, as I was listening to these questions, and I confess I, I shared many of the same, um, given everything that's been going on since March, I would expect more violent crime to be occurring in the United States. But maybe one way of, of getting at it is we're seeing a decrease in policing effort at precisely the moment when we needed more, not less. Um, you know, I, I think that can still preserve one of your core points while acknowledging that, you know, any rational person looking at what's going on in the world or what's going on in the United States probably would have expected more violent crime this summer regardless. Um, I, you know, I don't know if that helps or not, but uh, like I said, it might be one way of couching it that still gets at your main point while acknowledging this is a weird summer under any definition. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that I disagree that, I mean, it sounds like you've restated my thesis perhaps more eloquently than me, you know, that we're seeing a decline in policing at precisely the time that uh, it was needed. Um, I do think it's it's important to note there were a bunch of research papers that were written right around June 1st and said, look, here's the pandemic crimes down, but it'll probably return to normal as things get back to normal. Nobody was saying, but there's going to be this massive homicide spike and shooting spike that is going to occur right over the summer. Uh, I mean, people were, were um, you know, looking at all this conglomeration of factors of of April and May and, and saying, well, declining social mobility means declining crime and, and things will, will get back to normal. So that's, that's why I think, that's why I keep coming back to this notion of the delta, the chain. We're seeing homicide spikes. We're not seeing homicide going back to, you know, some, some pre-existing level. And so there needs to be a spiky cause uh, 
Um, and I have to say that the notion that, you know, there are, well, there are a whole bunch of factors out there, the, you know, how, how would one go about testing that? I, uh, my prediction will be if we get back together in two years, I'll be able to run with my colleague, Professor Fowles, multiple regression equations that will put, uh, you know, deep policing as, as a much more powerful explanatory factor than, for example, unemployment or, or gun sales or any of those, that none of those are going to have the kind of unique spikiness that would be necessary to explain uh, this, this sudden surge. All right, <clears throat> let, me, uh, let me do a dramatic reading here of a question from Cliff that he has uh, uh, chatted in. Um, Cliff asks, do you have any data on what's causing the depolicing itself, um, you know, specifically? Order, is it orders from mayors, uh, from police chiefs, uh, slowdowns from cops sort of in a more organic way? So that's a, that's a great question. Um, and the quick answer is not really. Um, and in the paper, I try to suggest that I, uh, I try to lay out the different possibilities, but that I don't particularly care what is causing the depolicing. Uh, at least for right now, I'm trying to explain what's causing the homicide spike once everybody's on board, and it doesn't look like I've quite succeeded this afternoon, but I'll keep trying. But once everybody's on board for the theory that it's depolicing, then we'll go to the next level and, uh, and figure out what's causing that. That becomes much more, uh, much more controversial, I'll say, because uh, the causes of depolicing range from blue flu, for example. The cops say, well, you're mad at us, fine. We won't, we won't uh, do anything, and now you'll, we'll see how you like it. Um, it's a deliberate work, uh, work uh, stoppage, which, by the way, is illegal, uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know, frequently has been alleged to occur. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about that in New York City. I don't think the data really supports a blue flu in New York City, uh, and it may be that each city has their own explanation. For example, in New York, there's been a very controversial bill called the diaphragm bill that says if you depress someone's diaphragm, even unintentionally while making an arrest, you're guilty of a misdemeanor. Uh, and so the cops have made fewer arrests or what I'm hearing anecdotally from people there. Uh, you see in Minneapolis uh, declines in vehicle stops and, uh, and pedestrian stops. I think it's just the cops are demoralized there. Uh, have there been system-wide uh, redeployments? In Chicago, they've been trying to restructure their police forces. And they've had, they actually restructured them in August with apparently some modest uh, success. So it's probably gonna be every city tells a different story, uh, but I think the stories are all gonna converge on the notion of depolicing. All right, um, Professor uh, Bob Flores, uh, did, you have, did you have a question uh, that you wanted to ask? Um, sure, I'll, I've been putting comments in the chat and I'll just uh, kind of summarize those. So uh, one point is simply that um, a cause or set of causes for violent activity uh, could sort of just be crudely uh, described as anger, frustration, outrage, anger. Um, and the, uh, the recent phenomenon of uh, uh, camera footage of uh, the George Floyd type uh, police abuses has produced enough emotional energy to get people out protesting. Um, and that includes not only the, the sort of traditional core of, a, uh, of rioting being minorities, but lots of non-minorities are participating in the protests now. Um, so the same energies uh, that go into the protesting um, may be in some people uh, released in the form sort of crudely of just violence. You know, people react out of anger in, in different ways. The protests are a good channeling of anger, except, of course, when they uh, veer off into overturning and burning, burning police cars and defacing courthouses and that sort of thing. So that I don't think that uh, explanation for uh, an increase in homicides can be ignored. I don't know exactly, I don't know how to test it, or explain it, but it, it's mm. good, just sort of common sense is that, that it's some kind of factor. And, um, and then on the flip side, if the argument is for a rebuilding or perhaps even uh, more extensively building up policing, having more resources directed at policing, uh, 
one of the arguments is, that's part of this whole defunding the police movement, which, you know, it's badly phrased, it just raises people's hackles to, you know, Burgess Owens is <laughs> going to make capital with that, right? Um, but underlying that or connected with that is the idea that resources could be directed to other tools, other methodologies uh, that uh, minimize the, the anger, the tensions that are reflected in the protests and I think probably are reflected in the homicides as well. Um, so um, a, a counter to an argument saying let's put more resources back into or even greater resources than we had before into policing would be well could we get more bang for the buck could we get a more effective results from taking those resources and uh, using them instead on uh, mental health services social work services um, other kinds of community building activities um, that would get at the causes whereas policing just sort of tamps down the actions but doesn't really get to the underlying causes two sort of connected arguments or issues there yeah no they are connected and they are and those are those are very thoughtful points uh, on, on the first point this mental energy point i mean it's an interesting one as you acknowledge, it's unquantifiable. So it's always hard to say, I'll bet it's the blue unicorn that's causing the problem. Now go uh, see if the blue unicorn is there. If it's not quantifiable, it, it's hard to, to figure out how to test it. I guess the one thought that I would have is that, uh, that we don't have to explain uh, what's going on by looking at you know the, all of the protesters that are out there. The homicides, everyone agrees, are committed by a tiny, tiny fraction of uh, the community that are the shooters. So the question isn't, you know, what, what is happening in particular communities, it is what is happening among shooters in those communities. And I'm not really convinced that, you know, anger about um, police violence is, is changing the behavior of the shooters. I think what's changing the behavior of the shooters, and there's pretty good anecdotal evidence of this, is the shooters know, hey, I can carry a gun out on the streets in Chicago and nothing's going to happen to me because the cops are running around dealing with the protests. Uh, and last week, somebody shot my friend and I'm going to go shoot somebody else's friend this week. So I think you've got to change, uh, you know, figure out how the mental energy argument links into the shooters. The second point about sort of dealing with causes and minimizing anger and community policing. I mean, one of the things that I guess is remarkable to me is I picked these five cities because Rosenfeld had identified these as the three of the main cities, Chicago, Philadelphia, and Milwaukee. Minneapolis is where the violence started, and uh, New York is the nation's largest city. One of, those, one of the things that all five of those cities have is reformers who are running the police departments. Minneapolis has an African-American chief of police. Chicago brought in David Shaw just a couple of months ago, uh, African-American from Dallas. Uh, NYPD, Mayor de Blasio, of course, has made police reform one of his main efforts. Philadelphia has a, quote, progressive, close quote, district attorney that's been trying to do a lot of things there. So it's not like somebody, you know, woke up, you know, and said, hey, light bulb, let's, let's think about community policing and less, uh, you know, less aggressive law enforcement. That's actually been going on in these cities for, for several years now. So um, I, I don't think that's ultimately going to be the explanation for how we solve this new new violence because it, it's been tried and, um, you know, maybe I'm going out and as I perhaps want to do pressing conclusions that are beyond the data, but it, it seems to me like those approaches have been tried and found wanting, particularly uh, uh, this summer. All right, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I, I'm going to uh, ask some questions of my own here. Uh, these, are, these are not close. So, um, one sort of small bore thing, and then I'll move to the bigger picture, is just the, um, the rural versus urban comparisons. You know, anecdotally, I, I uh, see the idea that there's a disjunction here, but my understanding of rural crime data is that it's, we're years behind. We won't have 2020 rural crime data until, you know, 2022 or 23 or something like that. Uh, so that might just be something to note in the paper or, or you know, it just makes the uh, comparisons really difficult, which is unfortunate. I mean, we need better data from these areas because it would be really helpful for this. Um, 
uh, and for the thesis of the paper. And then um, just to try to take a, a unique spin on, on some of the um, great comments that people have had about you know, the possibility of other factors uh, also playing a role here. Um, uh, from reading the paper, I noticed that there was a huge spike in homicides in New York in April, right, about a month or, or more so than uh, uh, in advance of any protests or, or uh, what have you. I guess I'd be interested to hear what your theory is about what caused that. There, there were similar spikes, albeit not quite as enormous, in Milwaukee uh, and some other cities, not uh, Minneapolis, however. But um, so I'd be interested to hear your theory of why those spikes occurred uh, and how that, you know, how I can sort of disaggregate the possibility of this uh, May, the post May spike was caused largely by um, depolicing versus it was, you know, it was, that was a trigger uh, that set off, you know, a bunch of effects that already were involved, right? That, that were sort of ready to be set off. And then indeed sort of seemed to go off uh, a month before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying, I don't have a, I mean, to be up front uh, immediately, I don't have a good theory for the, um, the April homicide spike in, uh, in New York. Uh, what I'm, I'm trying to find is my, I, one of the things to remember about homicide data is that um, it's chunky. You know, if, if there are five people shot at a restaurant, that uh, you know produces a, a you know a mini spike or whatever, and it could well be that there was something like that in April in New York City. If you go to the shooting data, which involves a much larger number of data points, um, data I'm looking at the uh, you don't have it, but I'm looking now. There is you know it, it's much smoother. Um, there isn't a huge and noticeable spike. It looks like for maybe one week it's just slightly above historical averages in April, and then it it goes back down. So I'm going to predict that if we drilled into April data in New York, we'd find that there were a couple of, of shootings that occurred for, for isolated reasons and there wasn't a kind of long-term long -term trend. But that certainly is something that, uh, you know, that I, need, I probably need to, to look at a bit more carefully. Thank you. By the way, uh, it, it doesn't show up nationally. The very first slide that I presented, the Rosenfeld slide, there is no spike in April nationally. So um, the you know, if you aggregate you know, one of the, you know, if you go to the forest rather than the trees, the, the structural break doesn't occur in April, it occurs the last week in May. All right, uh, we may have time for uh, just one more question if anyone wants to uh, ask or else we can uh, perhaps wrap up. Any, any other uh, questions? All right, well, um, I, I need to uh, run the class myself. So we, let's, uh, uh, a round of applause for, for, for Professor Cassell. Thanks. A silent round of applause on Zoom. <laughs> Thank you for also for being our first uh, presenter in this new format and for bearing with us with the schedule changes. Uh, th thanks very much. Thanks, thanks for all those comments, everyone. I'll work on that uh, and see if I can uh, make round two even better than uh, round one.